Oh, <laughs> that is badass. I know. I'm so stupid. <laughs> Meet Ale Bo, a full-time traveler and digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. This is the Radio Vagabond. Hey, you. This is me speaking from right now, late July 2023. I'm back in the U.S. and I've just had the pleasure of reconnecting with some old friends in Connecticut. I was here five years ago for what they call Connecticut Couch. It's a couch crash, which is something they do in the couch surfing community. Basically, it's three, four days full of activities and I attended that when I was here five years ago. So I thought in this week's flashback, I'll take you back to when I was here the first time. You can hear what a couch crash is all about and get to meet Jason and Margaret and some of the other people that I'm now lucky to be able to call friends. This is a mashup of two episodes I did from the Connecticut couch surfing couch crash called Kinetic Couch. Yeah, enjoy. Now I'm in Connecticut, my third of the six states here in New England. And uh, when I was looking for a place to stay here, uh, the guy that I wrote to on Couchsurfing.com, he said, can you get here a few days earlier because something exciting is going on for four days, uh, for three days starting uh, Thursday night until uh, Sunday night. And uh, that's why I'm here. I'm staying with the guy who's uh, in charge of the whole thing, who's sort of the the godfather of the of this event his name is Jason and uh, he's taking me in and uh, putting me up in in his house but what's going on the next uh, few days uh, well in a minute i'm going to uh, a kickoff party and then on then tomorrow i am uh, going to visit the mark twain museum i'm going for a walking tour i'm going to another party at night on saturday i'm going on a hike and uh, yet another cookout party uh, and on Sunday pancakes in the park sort of a brunch fest is what they call it and then we're going to visit the Pest factory you know those uh, white um, uh, candy things that uh, is always in a plastic container where you tilt the head and out comes a Pest these things are being produced here in, in Connecticut and then at night on Sunday there's pizza in the park and the uh, farewell party this is all part of the uh, Connecticut couch surfing community and as far as I can see there are hundreds of people coming and um, lots of events and I'm sure I will find some new friends among those people. I'm really looking forward to this. Let me tell you a little bit about the couch surfing concept before I meet my new friends here. Couchsurfing.com is a free platform where travelers and hosts find each other and organize a place to spend the night. It's called Couchsurfing, but typically you don't sleep on a couch. I've done it all over the world and every time I've had my own room. You basically just sign up and get free access to available hosts. Couchsurfing was launched in 2004 and today they have more than 15 million users. You can search for hosts in over 200,000 cities all over the world and you have the opportunity to message these hosts and kindly ask them to open their home for you for no cost. So no money changes hands, but you shouldn't see this as a free hotel. It's expected that you talk to your host and get to know them. I mean, that's why they're opening their doors in the first place. Yeah, it's nice to save money when you're traveling, but that shouldn't be the main reason. It's also normal to give them a small gift. It can be a bottle of wine, or maybe take them to dinner, or bring them something iconic from your hometown. But it can also be you singing a song, if you got that skill, or telling a cool story. Hi! Hi! How are you? I'm good. Good, Jason! Yeah, hi, Jason. A man walks into a bar and meets Jason and his partner Lee. I know that sounds like a beginning of a bad joke, but that's what's happening here. It's a bit noisy and not ideal for recording a podcast, but thankfully we go out back where they have a more quiet area and some tables. 
So I've been dying to know how to pronounce your name. Everybody. Kaya? Kala. Kala? Kala. Okay. <laughs> is, it, is it Danish? Yeah. It is a Danish name. You are listening to the Radio Vagabond, your guide to taking that first step towards living a more fulfilling and adventurous life. If Palabo can do it, why can't you? So now we're here uh, in Connecticut with a nice cold beer, and I'm with uh, Lee and Jason. And, and Jason, you're you're one of the organizers, or you are the man. Well, I wouldn't say the man, but I am one of the organizers. Yeah, and you're wearing a T-shirt that says "hosts." So, can you tell me what is going on? What is this thing that's going to happen this weekend? Wow, I mean, this is the second one we've done. So we had such a great turnout last time that we wanted to do it again. And uh, we're just bringing people from all over, hopefully the world. Uh, you're here, so we'll have some other people from all around that are flying in and coming in and showing that even though Connecticut's a little tiny state in the United States, there's really a lot of interesting stuff here for people to see, whether it's, you know, history or the outdoors or just some really interesting, neat stuff. You know, Connecticut's got a lot of stuff happening. This is their second couch crash, and they call it Kinetic Couch, since it takes place in Connecticut. Not only is this my first couch crash, it's also my first time in Connecticut, and I'm not the only one. Not many tourists come here, even though it's so close to both New York and Boston. Yeah, I mean, it's we're an hour and a half, two hours from New York, an hour and a half, two hours from Boston, and yeah, you got to see Boston, New York. There's some, you know, some famous things and nice places to see in the city life there. But when you get to Connecticut, um, there's a lot of history and outdoor and beauty, and and uh, Connecticut more so was very industrial in the early 1900s, late 1800s, and a lot of firsts happened here in the. In Connecticut, the first hamburger, you know, the first uh, telephone booth, uh, yeah. things like that are all from Connecticut. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff, great stuff happening here. And a big casino. And a big casino. Where you work. <laughs> <laughs> I was just told the story about it. Maybe we should uh, share it uh, because I would I would think Macau or uh, Las Vegas or maybe Atlantic City, but it's 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 here. Yeah, I mean, uh, actually, two of them. The, 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 at the time, the two largest casinos in the world. It, when they say casinos, it's gaming floor space. So, you've got a lot of casinos in Macau, a lot of casinos in Las Vegas. So, they share a lot of competition. So, they can't grow as large with their gaming floor. But because there's not a lot of competition up here in Connecticut, the gaming floor space is huge. Um, so, yeah, big place, make a lot of money. Lot, and again, it's in the middle of nowhere, so it's nice. You're not just in this big city. Uh, you've got a lot of stuff to see around that's uh, not just gambling. What do you do there? Stand at the roulette table or deal cards or no security guard? Yeah, I don't know if I could do that. Actually, uh, I work in the uh, retail department. I'm the manager of the retail department for the casino. So I'm off the floor, which I prefer. The couch surfing community also organizes couch crashes. Those are multi-day events that members put together to celebrate their local couch surfing community. They are awesome ways for the locals and travelers alike to connect and learn about the area and see it in a whole new way. I've heard about them, that it's also a great way to make new friends and get an unforgettable experience. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. It's um It's a way to bring, you know, when you get a lot of couch surfers in a local area that are very uh, devoted and into couch surfing, to say, hey, you know, we, we want to show you what we've got here. Come see us. And um, Connecticut would might be the last place people would think of because it's such a small place. You'd think of New York or Boston or San Francisco or Detroit. But, uh, you know, we've got a lot happening here. We've got a really loyal, dedicated, active group of couch surfers here. So we, Lee and I used to host a party, or we do host a party for like the last eight years, and we finally got to the point where we had like 50, 60 people coming. We're like, hey, this is almost a couch crash. We could turn it into one. Let's make it a weekend. And uh, 2016, we did it for the first time and had about 150 people. We're like, hey, we got something going on. Let's do it again. Yeah, yeah. And, and you set, uh, set up a lot of different events that uh, we could choose from. The thing we wanted to do is make sure that Whatever you're interested in, there was something for you to do. So if it was history, there's something to do with history. You know, National Park, Colts, Coltsville State National Park, the, the newest national park in the country. 
is here in Connecticut, which is uh, Samuel Colt uh, invented the Colt 45 revolver. Um, so that's one of the things. If you want to go to a bar, we've got pub things and restaurant bar events. Uh, you want nature, we've got hikes, bike riding. Uh, the Pez Factory uh, for North America is here. So you get a lot of different quirky sort of tubing on the river if you want to just relax. Uh, what? what? Uh, river tubing. You're gonna, you can take a tube down, float down the river for a couple hours. And the okay, Nautilus submarine, the first nuclear power submarine, uh, all the submarines are built here in the United States for the Navy uh, in Connecticut. So there's actually the first nuclear power submarine. You can go on for free and go take a tour of it. So that's part of the weekend too. This is obviously recorded pre-COVID. Jason just told me that they were planning to do another Connecticut couch in 2020 that got cancelled. So now that's scheduled for August 2021. But only time will tell if that's also too soon. On Couchsurfing.com you can find upcoming events all over the world on the global Couchsurfing event calendar. Links in the episode notes and on the RadioVagabond.com. So, a couch crash is about getting to know the area it takes place. But most of all, it's about meeting friends and making new ones. Oh yeah, it's just, it's great meeting so many different people. And, you know, like I said, Connecticut's a small place, but to have people fly in from other parts of the country and the world just to come to the crash is really great. And, and you know, couch surfing, one of their, their taglines is, you know, friends you haven't met yet. And... Uh, It's true. You meet friends that you haven't. You meet friends you haven't met yet, and then you go stay with them. Or uh, and yeah, when, when I did my road trip uh, here in the U.S. last uh, last year, uh, I spent uh, time with a lot of uh, couch surfers, uh, and I still I still speak to them to this day. A lot of them. Yeah, actually, one of the things that I I promote is I call it deja surfing, where you know, geez, I think I've done that before, but it's you know, you you surf with someone and then they stay with you. And you host them, so it's like, geez, you know, I've met you. Before. I've I've stayed with people in other countries, South Korea, and uh, Sonia, my host there, has come and stayed with us here in Connecticut. Or Jean Marie, who's one of the people who really told me, showed me what couchsurfing was all about. Who lived in China at the time? I mean, I met him in Milan. He came and stayed with us this summer, uh, and you know, it's great to build those relationships. And, and uh, just a few days ago, I got a reminder on Facebook that uh, it was now it was two years ago. I w- made a new friend. I was my couch surfing host in Moldova. So, wow! Yeah, so so we 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 started chatting again. Uh, uh, what's been going on in your life and all that? So even though. A lot of them I, I don't speak to every day or every week or even every month, but uh, you, you still have the connections uh, all around the world. And for me, that's the way I get rich uh, from traveling. Yeah, well, you never know where you're going to end up. And knowing that you have connections all over the world and you want to go somewhere or they want to come visit you, you know, it's not that you have to travel. Just having them come visit you is great, too. You know, it, it's, it's an enriching experience. Yes, it's truly an enriching experience. Before I became a nomad and actually had a home, I was also hosting people. Just to mention a few, I had a German guy and a Colombian woman staying with me. The German was on a bicycling trip from the southern part of Germany to the northern tip of Norway and back. An interesting guy with a lot of stories. And the Colombian woman was living in Copenhagen, teaching math in a university, and wanted to see more of Denmark. So I showed her around, and at night she was teaching me how to salsa. I've also been couch surfing with my kids on a road trip from Denmark to France. We stayed with some wonderful people in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Ghent in Belgium, and Normandy, France. Truly unique local experiences that we wouldn't have gotten had we stayed at hotels. I'm going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going on the first of many experiences here the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford. Stay with us. You are listening to the Radio Vagabond. We'll be right back. The Radio Vagabond is supported in part by Hotels25.com. And something exciting is happening soon. We're building a new, improved website, more inspiration, and even better results. 
It's so exciting what's going to happen, and I can't wait to tell you more about it. If you're listening to this episode sometime in the future, after mid-March 2021, and I know a lot of you guys do, it's already there. So head over to Hotels25.com and make a quick search. I guarantee you that you won't find a better price anywhere. And in fact, if you do so, Hotels25.com will refund the difference. And now, another message from a listener. And this time, it's a voice message. Someone has clicked on the banner on the radiovagabond.com where it says, talk to me. Hi, Pablo. It's Phil Chatterson. I'm here in sunny Yorkshire. Uh, just wanted to say thank you for the podcast. You've got me through so far through the lockdowns here in the UK. It's great to travel with you every, every weekend as I do my cleaning around the house, feed the dogs, bake some bread and go to a different country with you. It's been a really long, hard lockdown, and we're not through it yet, but what's really kept me going is listening to you, listening to the places you've been and the people you're talking to. It really gives hope and light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you ever so much, and keep travelling. Take care now. Thank you, Phil, from sunny Yorkshire. Wonderful that you would take the time to say hi. And I'm not even going to spend many seconds talking about the fact that uh, my name is Pala, not Pablo. I know it's a difficult name for anyone not Scandinavian. And as long as you listen, Phil, you can call me Pablo anytime. Trust me, I've been called worse. If you also want to do what Phil did, click on the Talk To Me banner on the website, on the radiovagabond.com, or in the link in your podcast app. And then record your voice and re-record it if you don't like what you said. Once you're happy with it, just click send and I get a little sound bite that I can use on the show. Only thing is that this TellB app only works in Google Chrome, but both on a computer and on your smartphone. If you prefer to write, you can send an email to a listener at theradiovagabond.com or go to contacts on theradiovagabond.com and fill out the form. Thanks. All right, so and now back to Connecticut, where we're meeting the next morning on a square in Hartford. So Margaret is doing the Holtzville National Park. If you're doing that, please stand with Margaret. With 125 people living here, Hartford is the second biggest city in Connecticut after the slightly bigger Bridgeport. Um, the old New Gate Prison and Mine Tour. Old Newgate Prison Jason. right here. You don't have to stand too close to him, but at least just stand in that area. <laughs> Keep an arm's distance. Actor Catherine Hepburn was born here, and for 17 years, another famous person lived here. His name was Samuel Langhorn Clemens. But we all know him better as Mark Twain. I think during the course of this... I have a challenge. We all have to come up with the best Mark Twain fact. Okay. And uh, the rule is it cannot be true. It cannot be true. It cannot be true. Yeah. We need to convince other people that it will. Uh, okay, okay. You're going the front. You, no, you're going the front. Oh, you're, you're going the front. You're oh, you're going the front. Your legs are longer. The place that Mark Twain lived with his family is now a museum. And that's what I chose to do, even though that river tubing sounded interesting. How was the breakfast? Good. Good. Where are you, where are you guys uh, surfing? I'm staying with Jason and Lee. Oh, nice. Yeah. You won. We got yeah, the best, I did. The best dig. Yeah, that was perfect. Great. Okay, 12 minutes away. Head south toward Riverside Park. Let's do it. Sam Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, was born in 1835 <laughs> and died in 1910. When he was in his late 30s, in 1873, he had this house built and wrote some of his most famous stories here, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and its sequel, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. He's known as the father of American literature and the greatest humorist the United States has produced. Alrighty, everyone, here we are on the porch The house was built in 1874 for Samuel Langhorn Clemens and his wife, Olivia Clemens, originally Olivia Langdon. It cost $20,000 originally. It was budgeted at that price. However, some things don't change, and it went over for $40,000 instead. 
which makes it about $990,000 in today's money. Coupled with the interior design and furnishings, it was about $3 million today. However, the price is a lot higher due to really perspective period-wise, at least for the family back then. However, Sam Clemens did not spend a dime of his own money in the construction of this house, despite having been using his pen name for about 10 years at this point. It was his wife's inheritance that bankrolled this house and its upkeep for about the first five to 10 years. And that was really because Sam's writing career was just beginning in earnest, earnest when he moves into this house, and so he was not the most famous American in the world at that point. That title was actually held by Harry Beecher Stowe, who was living right next door in that White House over there behind the The house trees. measures 11,500 square feet, more than 1,000 square meters, and has 25 rooms throughout three floors. Quite big for an unknown writer, but you can do that if you have a wife with money. The house itself is a work of art, whether you're interested in Mark Twain or architecture. We learned a great deal about the history of Mark Twain's house, Twain and his family, and the staff that help manage and care for the home. If you want to visit after the pandemic, they're closed right now in March 21, I highly recommend that you make a reservation for tour tickets as far in advance as possible. It's a very popular attraction here, and you might not be able to get in if you don't. Link in the episode notes and on the radiovagabond.com. After the visit, one of the locals, Margaret, was going to take us for a tour around Hartford. So we get in the car, a big, cool Chevy, and she turns the key. Oh, <laughs> that is badass. I know. I'm so stupid. I, I, my son, every, all the men are all like, Margaret, you got to keep that. And I'm like, oh, my son, he's a mechanic. He got <laughs> so Margaret, here we are in your badass Chevy. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's 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 a huge truck, and the, when you started it up, it had a cool sound. And what, why do you have a car like this? <laughs> so, when I have a backstory, so you'll have to. I got, I'm going to regale you with this backstory. So. What happened was we, I had this old home that required a lot of maintenance, and I really needed a truck for my Home Depot runs, and so I bought a Chevy Silverado. When my kids moved out of the house, I decided to take to the road full time, and I had my tent and my kayak and my laptop, and I just wandered around the United States for about eight years. And then I came back, and I got, I got rid of my house, and I got an RV. And I, the truck was too heavy to tow behind the RV, so I got a Jeep. Mm. And I towed my Jeep. And then recently, my Jeep died, and oh. I needed to... I know, I was sad, because they're very social cars. I love them. <laughs> and did, did, did she have a name? She did not have a name. I, sh- I guess I should have gave her a name, but she was pretty cool. She was... She was really cool. Uh, she, I had this amazing rack on the top that allowed you to put a kayak and still have the top off. So, the, the, yeah, so you could go topless in it. So it was cool. And uh, so a lot of people would step by and go, what the hell is that on top? They thought I worked for Google because it looked like antennas up there, you know. And uh, they say, what is that on the top of your Jeep? And I'm like, oh, that's a kayak rack. Anywho, uh, it died recently and I thought if I ever go back on the road I would love to go back with my truck and my tent because that's how I was most comfortable in my kayak yeah. and so I bought another Silverado because it was super reliable and dependable yeah. and it's easy to put my kayak in the back yeah. and I can go places So yeah. and my bike throw my bike in there and so that's why I love riding a pickup truck yeah. but that, the, the time that you did the, the, the traveling around the US did, did did you work at the same time, or? I did. I worked full time, and a, I worked IT project management. So I worked full time, eight to five Eastern Standard Time. So if I was on the West Coast, that was double tough. That was double tough because that was freaking five o'clock in the morning, and I am not a morning person. Well, well, so. Tell me about that. Uh, <laughs> a, a few days ago, I had to uh, direct a studio, uh, an actor in a studio in Copenhagen at ten o'clock. Copenhagen time, time. <laughs> so that was three o'clock, and uh, no, four o'clock uh, 
my time, time here. Yeah. So, yeah, that's tough. I I had. It's me. more easy when you're in Asia, uh, yeah. for for me, for me at least, not for you, but for for me with the Danish clients. And then I can sleep late, and they they go to work uh, at at two o'clock in the afternoon. Right. So that's better. And that's how it was for me going to Europe. I would go to exactly. Europe. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. would go to Europe, and I, I would work from noon their time or one o'clock their time to nine or ten and Europe's fabulous because the restaurants are always open till late at night and so I, I could explore in the morning work all day and then go out and still enjoy the nightlife when people ask me how long time I'm going to live this nomadic lifestyle and when I'm going to settle down again I always say Well, until one of my kids starts having kids themselves, and I become a grandfather. Both of them are only in their mid-twenties and busy studying in universities. Amanda is studying arts and design at the prestigious Danish Design School in Kolding, Denmark, and Clara is studying anthropology at Aarhus University, also in Denmark, and actually just wrote her bachelor about digital nomads. They both say that if that's what I say, I'm going to be traveling for a very long time because they are nowhere near starting a family. Margaret's story is quite similar. So, my son, his wife, they had a baby. And I became a grandma, which was freaking awesome. While I was there, I met a man. I fell in love. And I said if I had a chance for love, that I would, um, that I would settle down. And I did. However... I miss it terribly, and I am scheming every day to get back on the road full time. The reason we're in Margaret's car is that she's going to give us a tour of Hartford, and that's something she's done before, as she used to work as a tour guide. All right, you guys ready for this? Yeah. Come on now. Where's your Where's your microphone? I don't need it. I got a big outdoor voice. All right, you guys are so lucky. This. Let's get to know a little bit more about Hartford. And now, facts about where we are. The first English settlers arrived in 1635, and their settlement was originally called Newtown. But it was renamed Hartford two years later in 1637. So the city is almost 400 years old. And Hartford is among the oldest cities in the United States. Being such an old city, they have a few firsts here. Hartford is the home to the nation's oldest public art museum, the Wadsworth Athenaeum, and the oldest continuously published newspaper, the Hartford Courant. Hartford is nicknamed the insurance capital of the world because headquarters of many insurance companies are here and insurance is still the region's major industry. And the city was the setting of Amy Brenneman's series, Judging Amy, which aired from 99 to 2005. However, it wasn't recorded here. And that was Facts About Where We Are. Margaret lives in Manchester, where we're heading right now, but she grew up here. I did. I grew up there, and I honestly, I really like the town. I know Connecticut doesn't get a lot of press um, among international people. Uh, you know, it seems like everybody knows Massachusetts and New York, but nobody knows that Connecticut's in between. And anytime I have an opportunity, even people who live here don't really get it. So I, I just... I've always enjoyed okay, the okay. historic stuff. Then educate me and uh, my listeners. What is unique about Hartford, uh, especially Hartford? Uh, why should people come here? So <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot here. You are. Well, if you like history, in particular American history, or how nations are formed, I think there's a lot of information here that lends itself well to um, how to start a country and governing themselves in a democratic kind of way and um, a lot of the first that um, this country had uh, came out of 
Connecticut, you know, the original colonies. Mm -hmm. And oh shoot, I was supposed to go that way. <laughs> Oops. We just and missed we just the turn. turn. <laughs> and, and, and you live in Manchester, and we're going to Manchester, so. I know, well, see, uh. I was. Preoccupied and, 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 and fuzzy. Yeah, fuzzy and, and, we ha and we have people following us, so now they're lost as well. <laughs> oh. I am uh. so sorry, Margaret. Can you forgive me? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's, you know, my kids, they were always so mad at me when I take them driving because we always ended up taking the scenic route, we referred to it, and they're like, Ma, can you just get us there without, you know, so unfortunately, yeah, it's true too. We have people following us and. Oh my gosh! No, back 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 to Hartford. Oh, okay. can, can can you multitask? <laughs> 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 Do you want me to be quiet while you figure out where to go? No, no. Hart, Hartford is also the insurance capital uh, of the, the insurance. Is it of the, of the world know, or was, of the. Well, it was of the world for a while but I think uh, I think other places have kind of taken that over and, pre and well, how did that happen? but we have um, well you know Connecticut's probably not the most business friendly place in the world so I, it definitely with this last administration is not the most business friendly place in the world uh, so that's unfortunate right now um, so a lot of companies moved out um, so hold on a second While Margaret is finding her way from the city she grew up in to the place she lives in now, let me mention that this episode is partly supported by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best deals on hotel rooms and guest houses and hostels and apartments all over the world in one simple search. Hotels25.com, it's best price guaranteed. By the way, you should check out Margaret's blog and consider getting the book she wrote after her life on the road. It's called Lessons from the Road USA by Margaret Webster. Let me read a few words about the book from the back cover. Lessons from the Road USA shares the travel adventures of a funny, single, 50-something-year-old woman traveling across the U.S. in a pickup truck. And then it goes on to say, wait for it, Webster is navigationally challenged. <laughs> After getting lost with her just now, all I can say is, no kidding. Her blog is called LFTRUS, short for Lessons from the Road US. It's also packed with a lot of travel tips. I've got links to both the book and the blog in the episode notes and on the radiovagabond.com. Okay, let's get back to the navigationally challenged Margaret to see if she found the right road back home. Um, so the, the the GDP here, the gross national product, if you will, or per person, it's supposed to be the richest state in the nation. Um, but, you know, the regular people, they don't live rich. It's just that way because the numbers skew it because insurance companies are basically the invisible bankers. They make a lot, a lot of money. And um, so, you know, it's unfortunate because there are a lot of people in need here. But, um, but still, I like it as a state. It's a beautiful state. If you like history, you like U.S. history, it's a great place to go. Um, and it's it's relaxed as well. Like some major cities you go to, it's a little frenetic. You know, if you don't like crowds, um, you know, it's definitely... A, a and, and we're only two to three hours uh, northeast of uh, New York City. and uh, an hour and a half. So maybe two hours. To, well, you know, so that's relative. If you're doing it at three o'clock in the morning, it's two hours max. If you do it at three o'clock in the afternoon it's gonna maybe th be three hours yeah. but most people you can take the train from Harford to New York and and get there pretty easily although there are stops so it might take a little, a little while. and also we're pretty close to Boston as well so yeah, we're yeah. an hour and a half from Boston. we're basically in between the two and it's funny because there's a whole personality conflict that we have here um, so there's a river that crosses through Connecticut so there's east of the river and west of the river 
And often people won't travel over the river to the other. They oh, just, they, and they have kind of an air about it. Like, I don't travel west of the river. I don't travel east of the river. <laughs> um, but oh, also, you're, or you're born on the wrong side of the river. Also, we have this, yeah, families get torn up by sports teams between Boston and New York. Oh. So you'll have, you know, diehard Boston fans and diehard New York fans. And I know, like, my family, I, te- I personally tend to lean towards the underdogs, which is usually Boston. And um, <laughs> I, th- I, th- I, thought, I thought it was all Patriots here. No. Oh, no. no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Giants. No, no, no. But, well, for football, you have Patriots and Giants. And then for baseball, there's definitely the Red Sox versus the Yankees. And that's crazy. And my son was a Yankees fan, and and he'd walk through the house with a Yankees hat, and I'd look at him like, what the hell is that? Are you seriously wearing that in the house? And he's like, well, yeah. And I'm like, why? And he's You are like, no longer my son. <laughs> and he'd look at me and say, ma, they're winners. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. So it's true, they kind of are winners. But, and, yeah. and actually, actually, uh, earlier today, you told the story about how Yankees became Yankees. That's right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the Dutch first came to this to this part of the country. Uh, they came up the Connecticut River from Manhattan, which you know it was basically a Dutch colony. Uh, New York was. Uh, they set up a little fort in the Hartford area, what is now the Hartford area, and then at the same time, a couple years later. Uh, uh, a uh, English pastor from Massachusetts Bay Colony by the name of Thomas Hooker had come with a contingent of folks and some some animals and stuff and uh, came from Massachusetts into Connecticut and settled in that same area. The Dutch weren't paying attention to this area because they were dealing with problems in Manhattan. And when they came back, they realized that these people were like, who are these people and why are they living in our area? And they tried to get them out, and there were skirmishes, but ultimately they said it's not worth it. And they they left, but they were not happy about it, so they called them Yankers, which is spelled J-A-N-K-E-R-S, and but pronounced J is pronounced as a Y. And so that's where the term Yankees came from, and what that means is you're... In, in Dutch, it would probably be more like... <laughs> or something. <laughs> probably. Probably. And it meant thief. You're a thief. It, so. it meant thief... Okay. You stole our land. Oh. Screw you guys. You're Yankers. So, and that's where it came from. And that's so funny that and now we they wear it proudly. You wear it proudly, <laughs> <laughs> and I bet 90% of the people who wear it proudly don't know it me uh, what it means. What it means no. now, they have no idea what no. it means. If travel is your passion and you want escapism while still upholding your work and family responsibilities, you can travel vicariously from the comfort of your own home. This is. The Radio Vagabond Podcast. The first day was our Hartford day. We had four different things to choose from. And as you heard in the latest episode, I chose to do the Mark Twain House and Museum in the morning and the Hartford walking tour with Margaret in the afternoon. Other options were a visit to the Old New Gate Prison a former prison and copper mine, and adventures in the nature, a hike, a visit to Watworth Falls State Park, and then that river tubing I was talking to Jason about in the latest episode, where you flow down the Farmington River just west of Hartford. Before Margaret joined us when I was exploring Mark Twain's house, she did a tour of Coltsville National Park, where Samuel Colt started his Hartford factory on the banks of the Connecticut River in 1847. Yes, that Samuel Colt, as in Colt Firearms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Samuel Colt um, was uh, an entrepreneur. Here's Margaret again. Who had wanted to gun manufacturing. He had a design for a gun. He actually started in a place in Patterson, New Jersey, and he failed. He didn't do very well. So he came up here and to Connecticut and decided, and he was from Connecticut, decided that he would start a manufacturing company here. However, he wasn't well received by the people uh, that the legislature in Connecticut at the time because they knew he had had a failed business. The banks didn't want to give him any money. The city municipality didn't want to give him any land to do this stuff, but he somehow scavenged money from someplace and built up 
this manufacturing empire. Uh, at the same time, the Civil War was going on, so anytime there was a war, that would beef up manufacturing uh, mm. for weapons. And yeah. so that's, you know, there was a, a kind of a bunch of things that happened that allowed him to be very successful. Uh, however, he didn't um, have the company long before he passed. He passed in his 40s, and uh, he actually gave the company, he willed the company to his wife, which was back then was unheard of, and it was a scandal. Mm. And his wife was young. She was in her 30s. She was younger, about 12 years younger than him. And she stood like four foot nine and, you know, small woman. And But she mm. ran that company like a boss she was badass mm. she took care of the community took care of people she ran the company when, 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 are, we, when are we talking about in the elizabeth 18 1862 yeah. i think he yeah. passed away she she couldn't vote but she could run a company, company. Yeah. yeah and she did really really well she made tons of money supported thousands of people in you know their work by wow. manufacturing this stuff and you know leaves a legacy today so yeah. she elizabeth colt she's yeah. one of one of my personal heroes yeah wow. yeah. yeah samuel colt himself he was a he was kind of a strict uh, leader he was he was he he was a bit of megalomaniac and a bit of like military precision kind of guy and he really wanted uh, he wanted it to be pretty austere, you know, like people, they did one thing, they did one thing good and that was it. And they were going to do it repeatedly every single day, the exact same way. And if they deviated any which way, they were fired. He fired more people than Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know, but there are, there are accounts of him firing people because they were late to work, because they fell asleep at work, because they just, uh, you know, weren't they were being sloppy because they weren't dressed appropriately. I mean, he would just fire people. Or, or if they had a good idea. Yes. So so there was Rollins White, who was a friend of his and an engineer. And he went to um, Samuel Colt and said, Hey, Sam, I noticed there was this thing on this revolver. And if we do this, we'll improve the design, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and he was like, how dare you come and try to, you know, up one my design because my design is the best and you suck. So you're out. You're out. So, so he, he was fired, fired to point out we could improve, improve the it. product. He, yep, you're out. So he promptly turned around, got the patent for it, went to Winchester, which was in New Haven, Connecticut, and said, hey, you guys want the patent on this? And they're like, yeah, we want the patent on that. And they took the patent and they, and they gave him, Rawlings White, they gave him 25 cents for every gun that they, and he didn't care, I don't think. I honestly don't think he cared. He just wanted to screw Samuel Colt because he was pissed off at him for being that way. And so the Winchester people, so what happened was Colt would try to improve his, his design and the Winchester people kept bringing him into court for antitrust <laughs> violations. Oh. And so he couldn't upgrade his design. And so that was kind of the, that was one of the funny and that'll, that'll cheat him. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And now we're heading towards the official kickoff party at Tomato Joe's and Shea's American Bar and Grill in Margaret's hometown, Manchester, Connecticut. Now we're heading to Manchester. Yeah. Uh, do you have a, a football team called Manchester United? <laughs> no? no, we don't have no. one of those. Oh, now no, I'm disappointed. I know. What, I know. What, 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 so kind, what kind of city is Manchester? It's it's kind of a it's it's like everything else in Connecticut, kind of split in two, right? So you have this big mall area and it's like a little city into itself but i live on the village side where we live in an old industrial mills for they were textile mills they made silk and velvet and ribbons there and uh, they've converted them now to apartments so it's very historic and it's a beautiful community and there's a downtown area it's kind of villagey um, but the other side is more you know commercialized big malls you know very kind of american you know, mallish kind of place. There's a lot of stores and, you know, but it, it's nice. I like living there. It's very diverse. 
which I like. I love a diverse environment. I like people of different colors and different languages and different abilities and different everything, you know. So I think Manchester is a really nice place for that and still like a a lovely community to um, raise children in. So, yeah, I I like it. I really enjoy it. I have to remind myself that some birds aren't meant to be caged. I guess I just miss my friend. But then I also smile, knowing that I get to travel with him simply by putting on my headphones and listening to the Radio Vagabond podcast. The Radio Vagabond. Gotta keep moving. So this was Friday. The next day was Colchester Day. Yes, another place named after a place in good old England. But I guess that's okay since we're in New England. In the first episode of this season, we were already talking about Boston being named after the small town of Boston, England. Here in New England, we also find uh, Bristol, Leeds, Oxford, Cambridge, Southampton, Dover, Ipswich, Essex, Middlesex. I can keep going. So I will. Kensington, Lancaster, Bath, Surrey, Nottingham, Kent, Coventry, Westminster, Sheffield. And this is just around 5% of the English location names that have been reused here in New England. Yeah, Google it, my friend. And if you think that Manchester here in Connecticut is the only Manchester in New England, (laughs) think again. New, new, new. As far as I can see, they have at least one Manchester in each of the six states in New England, and there are 35 Manchesters in total in the USA. But there are Manchesters all over. And as far as I know, also not a single Manchester United. If travel is your passion, and you want escapism while still upholding your work and family responsibilities, you can travel vicariously from the comfort of your own home. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. Okay, back to Connecticut. I was spending the nights at Jason and Lee's wonderful house in Colchester, and that was where the group met up the next morning. This Saturday was Colchester Day, and again, there were several different options to choose from in the program. Between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m., there were six different choices. Devil's Hop Yard Hike, Nautilus Nuclear Sub Tour, Fox Farm Brewery Tour and Tasting, Airline Trail Bike Ride, Nike Missile Site, and the one I chose, Godspeed Opera House. Look at it. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, yeah. It really is. It's the only part of this building that is a true restoration. When he built this and in 1876, a hundred years after we beat the pants off the English. We have any Brits here? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Too late. <laughs> After that, we went to Deep River Ferry and then a visit to Gillette Castle that looks like a medieval fortress, but a step inside the stone castle reveals the built-in couches, table trackway, and wood carvings that all point to the creative genius that was William Gillette super interesting building. After that, we went back to Jason and Lee's house for the Connecticut Couch Crash Cookout and Pool Party. They have a thing with titles. A fantastic day. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. Sunday, the last day at the Connecticut Couch, was New Haven Day with a walking tour of New Haven, Walnut Beach, John C. Peak Hike, rock climbing, and what I did, a visit to the Pess Factory. You know the iconic plastic Pess dispensers where you tilt the head back and get a small peppermint candy pushed out? Everyone knows Pess, the familiar little candies that bring back an entire childhood. I grew up with them, as did most of us. So it was funny to be here at the factory. That was actually more like a Pess museum. They have grown into being a collector's item all over the world. The factory is here, but Pez candy was actually invented in Vienna, Austria. Our story begins in 1927 in Vienna, Austria. Edward Haas III creates a peppermint product he markets as an alternative to smoking. 
The pest name、Mr. comes、Haas、from the German word for peppermint. Pfefferminz, combining the first, middle, and last letters of the name. In 1952, Pess came to the United States, and in 1973, Pess built the first candy manufacturing facility in Orange, Connecticut. In 1991, the first Pess Collector Convention is held in Mentor, Ohio, with Pess fans coming together from around the globe to share their prized collections. We're at the Pess Visitor Center that they opened in 2011. It's over 4,000 square feet, dedicated to all things PES. We got to see the largest, most comprehensive collection of PES memorabilia on public display anywhere in the world. The iconic PES motorcycle, the world's largest PES dispenser, and a viewing into the production area. Come learn about the brand that has been inspiring and innovating since 1927. There's also past trivia games, retail area, interactive history timeline, and much more. I was mostly amazed of how many different past dispensers there were, and it was interesting to learn about an iconic brand like that. Two, three, one. We ended the day. And the couch crash with pizza in the park, and then some kind of game where we were throwing things to see who could get closest. I'm at twelve. I'm really remembering my weekend with the wonderful people of Connecticut and all the other couch surfers at this couch crash, and I really hope that I'll be able to come back for the next one. It's Monday morning, and I have left. Connecticut. After、uh, spending three,、uh, well, four、uh, wonderful days、uh, in Connecticut at this couch surfing、uh, event that they call Connecticut Couch,、uh, a lot of、uh, a lot of meetups, a lot of、uh, sightseeing in in Connecticut, and、uh, I've through these wonderful people I've been、uh, given the chance to see. Uh, parts of Connecticut and, and 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 hear stories and most of all get to know the people of、uh, of this state. So now I, I I have a lot of new friends in in Connecticut and especially Jason and Lee that I、uh, stayed with、uh, for the last four nights. I really feel that I've、uh, I've gained some new friends and、uh, that for me is the most important thing about traveling to get new friends. My name is Palabo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya. Produced by RadioGuru.co.uk.